According to recent global studies from Oxford University, most of the world's people live in poverty. One billion people are still illiterate. Many countries, especially in Africa and Asia, have more than half of their population go no further than primary school education. The overwhelming majority of the world's countries suffer from corrupt or highly corrupt governments. One of the most reliable tools to address these pressing issues remains international aid and development. Hi folks, welcome to Realpolitik, a podcast where we gather to respond to pressing issues in global affairs by prescribing realistic foreign policy solutions for the governments of Canada and the United States. In our first episode, we will tackle the topic of international aid and development. Such a topic needs to be addressed as Western nations have struggled to find an international development strategy since the Second World War with the establishment of the Marshall Plan. Since then, Canadian and United States administrations have inconsistently switched development doctrines, bringing unnecessary confusion and ineffectiveness to their foreign policy and to the rest of the world. Striking the adequate balance between strict fiscal conservatism, pure non-intervention, and the idealistic preservation of global human rights, prosperity, and security has been a topic of contention in international relations intelligentsia for many decades and will be the aim of our policy prescriptions. Foreign policymaking is, like global politics, highly nuanced and complicated, and requires circumstantial rather than absolute goals and methods. Policies presented will step away from redundant cliches and will aim to be actual, useful, and pragmatic in nature, with the hopes of shaping Canadian and U.S. foreign policy doctrines for current and future administrations. With that in mind, this episode, similar to future episodes, will be divided into three equally long segments. First, we will respond to counterarguments to international aid and development, starting by defining our terms, values, and goals in this context. Then, a case for international aid and development as a foreign policy tool will be put forth. Finally, the details of my policy prescriptions will be outlined, describing how the current practices may be improved. We will conclude this episode with a brief recap of the lessons learned and the proposed policy solutions. This episode may act as a policy brief to guide Canadian and United States foreign policy regarding international development tools. I will now be responding to counter arguments to the notion of international aid and development as legitimate foreign policy tools. First, however, we need to define what we mean when we talk about aid in order to level the playing field. According to IE University professor Waya Kviger, international aid, also referred to as foreign aid, assistance, or simply aid, refers to, quote, the international transfer of goods, services, or capital from a country or international aid agency to a recipient country or its populations. There are several types of aid, including humanitarian disaster relief, economic aid to sponsor development or investments, military support, and healthcare programs, end quote. Aid may be given for reasons ranging from moral or altruistic interests to political or economic ones. Renowned historical examples of aid and development projects include the U.S.-led Marshall Plan during World War II and the joint military training on weapons given to Afghan forces by the United States and Canada since the beginning of the war in Afghanistan. Aid makes up an integral part of international development, although substituting the two terms would make for an inaccurate and incomplete description. International development, or simply economic development or development, is sometimes referred to as, quote, how to help poor countries get richer, end quote. Although simplistic, this description can be helpful in capturing the essence of the political goals behind development policies. It aims not to raise GDP, but to improve people's economic opportunities, working conditions, health, education, and overall well-being. Increasing levels of freedom, government accountability, and democracy may also be aims of development policy. As we will see later, these definitions are problematic in that they ignore the wrongful and neocolonial practices that have characterized international development policies for many decades, and still do in many cases. We will thus spend a segment of this podcast making a case not only for aid and development, but also for a better kind of aid and development, one which actually pays tribute to the definitions and aims to satisfy the moral and political objectives of improving life and government for all. Next, however, we will be addressing counterarguments to international aid and development as a foreign policy tool and practice. The first counterargument to aid and development is rooted in libertarian, non-interventionist, and isolationist thought 
it advances that it is simply not our place as outsiders to intervene, and that doing so will only waste time and resources and exacerbate the problems we're trying to address and solve. When used against military intervention, this argument can be persuasive and even objectively correct, although it is not when discussing economic intervention. In many cases, as many of the resources, technology, and labor were stolen from their hands by our own governments historically, we must intervene to offer justice and support. As presented by Columbia University professor on economic development and poverty, Jeffrey Sachs, we as countries must, quote, use our reason, management know-how, technology, and learning by doing to design highly effective aid programs that save lives and promote development. This should be done in global collaboration with national and local communities, taking local circumstances into account. The evidence bears out this approach, end quote. This counter-argument thus is not supported by much evidence and only serves as a cop-out, as is the case for the other counter-arguments we will look into. Some critics might argue that aid and development are counterproductive, as the money and resources only go into the hands of bad faith actors and corrupt parties and individuals. This argument does bear some truth from an historical perspective, especially when discussing military aid to governments and militias in Middle Eastern and African countries, such as the Mujahideen fighters in Afghanistan, Islamist rebel forces in Syria, and to the militaries of Saudi Arabia and Israel. However, instances of the contrary are far more frequent. Also, this is quickly remedied by simply not sending military aid, or by at least distributing aid in a way that respects rules of engagement, international law, and the universally established conventions of war instituted by the United Nations and the Geneva Conventions. This has been done successfully before in numerous conflicts, mainly in the interests of preventing genocide, including in Bosnia, Kosovo, and World War II. Moreover, studies show that aid coming from countries and organizations with comparatively little to no corruption, such as Canada and NATO, is far more likely to help fight corruption, rather than enable it. An extension of the first argument with the revamped nationalist allure is that we should begin by solving our own problems at home before engaging in solving problems abroad. Our country first, the detractors would say. There are many things wrong with this argument. First, no social or human system ever runs out of problems, no matter how trivial or minute, as perfection is logically unachievable. Moreover, there is a lot of underlying privilege behind this argument. If the circumstances were radically different and we were to find ourselves struck by unprecedented natural disaster, corruption, authoritarianism, poverty, or war, would we not want to be helped? With this argument in mind, how could we ever solve any global issues that come our way? Any interaction or negotiation with other countries would be impossible from the get-go, as we would have no chip to bargain and nothing substantial ever to offer. In an era of ever-increasing globalization, we must solve our issues by collaborating with our allies through diplomacy and negotiation and by extending our hand to those who need it, not by isolating ourselves. The coronavirus pandemic is only one of many examples of global issues that come to mind where the sole mention of such a global issue would dismantle the nationalistic argument at hand. This concludes our first segment on counter-arguments. I will now present my own arguments for why international aid and development are useful foreign policy tools. Now, upon facing counter-arguments and criticism, Against aid and development policies, we must naturally move on to make the case for such policies. Similar to the previous segments, the arguments presented for aid and development take many forms, the first one of which is based upon a state's responsibility to protect and its idealistic commitment to power equality. As double standards go, richer nations like Canada and the United States would wish to be aided if circumstances were different, especially when they would not have the means to help themselves. When dramatic events beyond a local population's control occur, such as natural disasters or state-led genocide and war, states in the predicament to do so must rush to the aid of the needing population. Furthermore, various factors, often beyond merit and talented statecraft, may determine the state's place within the global balance of power. Thus, in the interest of preventing war and of maximizing alliances and mutual gains, Global power must be maximally equalized and conceded by more powerful states towards less powerful ones. This kind of diplomatic intervention is preferable to purely militaristic and violent alternative. In many cases, 
The funds and resources distributed are channeled through private organizations such as Doctors Without Borders, who volunteer their time and services. Moreover, it serves to increase diplomatic ties between our countries and potential allies, or even strengthen and assert current alliances. In some cases, it may even curtail distrust between enemies and dissuade war. Since the Cold War, Canada and the United States have offered to help with crises in Russia, China, and many communist and former satellite states, and vice versa. During the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the United States notably got aid from Russia in the form of various pieces of medical equipment. In February, Canada did something similar with China, sending 16 tons of protective equipment there. Given the tensions between our countries, these gestures, which require relatively little to no resources and energy, are highly generous in their rewards for future cooperation and in the global struggle towards lasting peace and security. As alluded to in the previously presented arguments, aid and development policies may garner lasting, measurable benefits for the home nation as well. Although this point may seem counterintuitive, the evidence points precisely to this view. Firstly, coming to the aid of a destitute nation may give the aiding country quite a lot of leverage. For instance, economic development may lead to trade deals with the aiding nation, as their economic success is partly or fully due to the aid and development efforts of such a nation. The targeted nation may also be added to the giver's sphere of influence as a strong ally. This may be extremely beneficial in that it may grant a strategic position in potential ideological or even military conflict with other regional or global powers. As the aided nation is now indebted, this debt may be used for potential political leverage in favors or policy agenda setting. For this reason, we must allocate aid and development resources strategically in a way that benefits the giving country most. As our sphere of influence expands and alliances grow, the risk for global conflict, or at least conflict with such a country and or region, is reduced, and the likelihood for peace becomes much more prevalent. As it might seem that aid and development are purely altruistic and selfless in nature, they may actually grant the giving nation plenty of wealth and resources, as well as a much more advantageous position in the global balance of power, resulting in a net gain. Recognizing these self-interested motives would drastically heighten the chance of success for aid and development policies, as engaging countries would be much more invested in the outcome of such policies, as they could benefit them greatly. This concludes our second segment, where we argued for aid and development as generally useful foreign policy tools. We will now present specific policy prescriptions that may help guide aid and development policies and make their implementation much clearer. This segment will be used to detail policy prescriptions in regards to international aid and development and how they can be implemented in the most direct and efficient way possible. As was briefly mentioned in our introductory segment, aid only forms a part of development as a broader concept and policy tool. Aid, although useful in short-term responses due to it being less costly and resource-intensive and more clear-cut, is not optimal for long-term solutions and growth. In fact, foreign aid in certain cases may produce dependency which is unwanted if we presume the goal of these policies to be, quote, to help poor countries get richer, end quote. Development policies, however, have been proven through multiple studies to produce more long-term economic growth. Due to a subsequent rise in the middle class and to dropping economic inequality, it has also allowed for political institutions to flourish and instill a sense of trust, accountability, and freedom. As the old adage goes, Give someone a fish and you feed them for a day. Teach someone to fish and you feed them for a lifetime. This may describe the reality of aid versus development policies. Thus, in order to produce more long-term solutions, the best use of each tool, as prescribed by many experts in the UN Development Program, DFAT, formerly CIDA, and USAID, would be as follows. Use foreign aid as a tool when the conflict or disaster is at its peak and transition into a developmental approach as the conditions and risks soften. A way to define this would be if a war turns into a conflict, meaning less than 10,000 combat deaths per year, 
or simply end through a tangible and binding legal peace agreement, or in the case of a natural disaster, when the natural disaster is no longer a threat. This has been a strategy used in modern wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and the African Front. As hot wars turn colder, boots on the ground transition from providing temporary security food and shelter to civilians, to then building roads, schools, and houses, teaching local militias to keep the peace, and setting up political accountability mechanisms, such as fair and free elections and referenda. Hence, aid and development policies may both be extremely useful in adequate contexts. Secondly, we would need to implement an approach to aid and development funds and resources that prioritizes economic and political goals rather than military ones. Currently, our Canadian and U.S. governments have given and are still giving, in many cases, millions of dollars in military aid to various foreign governments and factions, including Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and rebel forces in Syria. This has proven to be highly ineffective. To go on a case-by-case -case basis, military aid to Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan has often been used to fight our own military and intelligence forces on the ground there, including with the Pakistani ISI, Iraqi and Afghan military forces, actively going against US and Canadian military orders, or even helping opposing terrorist forces. The Israeli military efforts against Palestinian forces has engendered countless human rights and international law violations, including in their illegal seizures of Palestinian lands through settlers, and in their use of white phosphorus, both forbidden and condemned by international law. Moreover, the Israelis hardly need it, as they have the most sophisticated intelligence and technological security operation in the world, and are fighting a group with no official state or army made up of hardly 6,000 soldiers with 120,000 soldiers and more than 3 million and more than 3 million more readily available for service. Similarly, Saudi Arabia has committed atrocious human rights and international law violations in Yemen, notably provoking a cholera epidemic, and extreme poverty and famine among the civilian population. In Syria with the Timber Sycamore program, Many of the rebel groups we had armed were in fact jihadi terrorist groups, some of them even working with other terrorist groups or against the Kurds and other rebel forces. Many of the weapons given would directly land in the hands of the Islamic State and other terrorist groups in Syria, Jordan, Iraq, or elsewhere. In one case, the CIA would fund two different groups that would then fight each other. With all this in mind, one of two policies would be in order. Number one, no more military aid distributed under any circumstance. Or number two, at the least, no military aid distributed to groups and actors who deliberately break international law and commit human rights abuses, notably by intentionally killing civilians or by using weapons forbidden by the Geneva Conventions. Economic assistance should then be prioritized also. As was mentioned prior in segment two, Aid and development funds and resources must prioritize in order of importance 1. Global power enemies 2. Global power allies 3. Middle power enemies and 4. Middle power allies Creating and reinforcing alliances with global powers must be prioritized due to their higher relative power. Assistance to middle powers may even be diverted to global powers if necessary unless there is a high likelihood of a middle power turning into a global power in the near future, combined with a high likelihood of the global power turning into a middle power soon. Rising middle powers may include India, Brazil, Iran, Turkey, and Japan. Current global powers are the United States, China, and Russia, although that might change in the future. In case of an arising dilemma, say when there are two middle power allies or two global power enemies competing for assistance, assistance would be granted to the country with the most relative power, based on their economic power, military power, and number of alliances. Following this logic, if China and Russia, both global power enemies of Canada and the United States, were to compete for assistance, China would be prioritized due to its higher relative power as a higher relative power presents a useful ally and an even mightier foe. This would be done in order to maximize relative power gains and to increase the likelihood of global peace and security.
In today's episode, we tackled the topic of international aid and development. We began by defining our goals, values, and terms, and by debunking counter-arguments to international aid and development as useful foreign policy tools. Finally, the details of our policy prescriptions were outlined, describing how the current practices may be improved. Throughout the episode, we proved that international aid and development may not only be purely altruistic in nature, but also a highly powerful way for countries to gain leverage, power, and resources in the global balance of power. This episode may act as a policy brief to guide Canadian and United States foreign policy regarding international development tools. Thank you for joining us in today's rendition of Realpolitik. Please join us on the 1st of September for a new episode, where we will explore how and why the war in Yemen is a bad strategy for the United States and Canada, and what we can do about it. Feel free to debate the ideas put forward in these episodes by submitting a comment, counter video, or by emailing us at realpoliticpodcast1 at gmail.com. All used sources for this episode will be in the description box below.